you all. And uh, good to be here today. Um, so yes, uh, I, I was kind of asked to talk um, about B2B, um, kind of the, the guest experience. So the whole kind of flow for this presentation, and if you've not heard me before, yeah, I have this funny accent. It's not the acoustics in the room. Uh, I'm from East, East Texas. Just keep going East. Uh, you'll, you'll get there eventually. Uh, so I'm going to kind of talk about guest scenarios when we think about uh, our organization. Uh, I'm not going to try and sing. It, it'd be terrible. Trying to, English person trying to do a French accent is never going to go well. Um, but I want to dive into when we think about as organizations, uh, very few of us in Ireland today, we want to collaborate with partners. And, and how do we do that in a secure way? How do I enable sharing of information but still maintain control of my IP? And so what I want to dive into is really just a super quick level set on Azure Active Directory. So just a quick show of hands. Who's actually using Azure AD today? OK, that's good. Everyone else, <laughs> you're tough luck. Um, no. uh, the challenge is with sharing resources. So what do we do today? What are some of the things we might have done in the past? That we create an account for everyone. We want to give some information to and then we have to manage those accounts. I want to talk about Azure AD B2B. So what this is, um, ways we can use it. And although no one likes licensing, I, I'm not a salesperson at Microsoft, I don't sell licensing. But with B2B, there are some fairly interesting intricacies we need to be aware of. Because when we think about the functionality that's exposed, people that are licensed in my organization, that impacts the features that I can allow my guests to have access to. So it's kind of important to understand what that relationship actually is. And then, who are these guests? Like, who can I enable to be a guest in my Azure Active Directory? And then, entitlement management. This is kind of a new capability. And it's really about how do we manage all of these relationships? How can I determine what they have access to? What apps, what groups, what SharePoint sites? And how can I make it more efficient? I don't want to manually go and add each person. And then super quick, if we have time, what is this B2C thing? So Azure Active Directory 101. Um, it is not Active Directory running in Azure. Um, very good marketing <laughs> from Microsoft. Uh, people trust Active Directory, so hey, we'll, we'll stick AD in the name. Um, it is not. There, there are no domain controllers running this thing. It, it's really more an identity provider that's designed for the cloud. Because Active Directory was fantastic. Active Directory is fantastic. Um, anyone not have Active Directory in their environment? No, you can all stay. Um, Active Directory is fantastic in my network. In my network, I have this great wealth of ports I'm allowed to communicate over. I can have secrets on these machines that we can use for kind of co-authentication. So it's phenomenal within an environment. I can do things like Kerberos, where I have all of those ports. But on the internet, it's really not going to work. Um, I don't have all those nice ports open that I would want to use if I want to do Kerberos. I don't have some nice secret I can give every single machine on the internet that I can use as part of that authentication flow. So while Kerberos, NTLM, they're fantastic within my environment, they're completely useless for the internet. So we think about Azure AD is designed to be that identity provider for the cloud. It speaks the cloud. If I think about what that means is, you've probably heard of OpenID Connect, SAML, WSZ, uh, OAuth 2 for authorization. It speaks those things. And the goal of it really is, you have AD already. How can we let this Azure AD thing just extend AD into the cloud in a really kind of seamless fashion so you don't have to do a whole bunch of work about it. Now, Azure AD does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm not going to try and go through all the different capabilities, a uh, different conversation. But some of the key things you'll care about are things like MFA, multi-factor authentication. We see these statistics, and I'll get it wrong, but it's saying about 99.99% of kind of these phishing attacks for passwords would be defeated if there was MFA in place. Conditional access, if you're not using conditional access today, go and look at this, go and use this thing. This is all about the idea that, hey, I can take a set of conditions, uh, maybe it's the user, maybe it's the group, maybe it's the location, maybe it's the health of the device, maybe it's some risk that I've detected, and then based on those conditions, 
I can set requirements before they're allowed to access some resource. Maybe it's the MFA, um, maybe it's some other type of check they have to pass. I think of it as a federation broker um, who only uses applications that are on-premises in their environment today. They don't use anything else in the cloud. Right. Um, so from all those cloud applications, how do you handle authentication? There's different ways we can do that. One is, this is kind of the old way, we get an account on each of those systems. And that's phenomenal. We end up with lots of different accounts, and I write them all down on a piece of paper somewhere, or I just use the same password on all of them. So if one of them is compromised, we're compromised everywhere. So the goal is to use our credential on all of those systems, and that's federation. So we as organizations can set up federation services, but one of the things kind of Azure Active Directory does, and I should have said this at the start, if there's questions, um, just kind of shout them out. I mean, we've got enough time. If there's things I'm saying that's not clear, I'm happy to kind of address it as we go along. But one of the things Azure Active Directory does, and I think it's one of the biggest things it does, is it's this federation broker. If I go and add an application, so it is federated with 3,342 apps. Now, they're not all true federations. Um, not everyone supports SAML or WS Fed. Um, they might not support SKIM, so there's this kind of cross-identity management capability. Maybe it's doing credential stuffing. So we kind of store a credential and then we would pass it through. But where possible, it's going to use SKIM for that cross-identity management, creating objects on the other side. Where possible, it's going to use a true federation. So rather than you having to manage the certificates, the claims, all of that stuff, a lot of that's done for me. And if there is an application that's not built in, well, hey, I, I can add. I can still go and do the SAML. I can say the claims. So we can add other applications as well. So Azure AD becomes kind of that federation service for you. Uh, PIM, Privilege Identity Management, lets me elevate up privileges for a finite amount of time. Again, if you're an administrator, if you have access to something important, you want to be using this feature. I shouldn't have standing privileges. I want to elevate up as required. And with Azure Active Directory, um, there are free SKUs, and there are ones you pay for. And obviously, a lot of the higher functionality, uh, give me your money. Uh, you're you're going to pay for those SKUs. So the way we typically see this work is you've got your Active Directory. Um, you've got your user accounts. You've got your groups. You've got all of that stuff in your AD. Then you're going to go and stand up an Azure AD tenant. And you're going to deploy this thing called Azure AD Connect. Who's got this? Who, who is maybe in charge of Azure AD Connect? A few people. OK. What this thing is, is really, uh, I'm trying to remember all the different names for it. There was MIIS, there was ILM, there was FIM, MIM, a whole bunch of different names for Microsoft's kind of identity synchronization solution. Azure AD Connect is kind of a light version of that. And what it essentially does is it has a kind of little connector space to talk to AD, a little connector space to talk to Azure AD, and a metaverse in the middle that lets me replicate stuff. And what it's going to replicate are my AD users and my groups. So now I have an object in Azure AD that represents it is a separate identity. Uh, it's kind of an important point. The, this one, this is not a federation. It is a separate object created in Azure Active Directory. Now, there is an anchor attribute, which links it to the Active Directory object, so we can relate them. But they are two distinct identities. Now, one of the options for Azure AD Connect is to send, now, it used to be called Password Sync. And unsurprisingly, everyone was like, no way, uh, not, not turning that on. And then we said, well, it's actually a password hash sync. So I'm still not turning that on. Um, who's got this turned on? Wow, that's a tiny number. OK, that's surprising. What the hell? <laughs> All right. So 30 seconds. We do not send the password hash. OK? It takes the hash. It converts it to a different hash. It does a per user sort. It runs it through a 1,000 char iterations. And it's that that gets sent to Azure Active Directory. It's not reversible. It can't get this hash out. And just being very transparent, we secure it much better than you do anyway. <laughs> Send us the hash. 
it's only goodness for you. Again, it's not the hash in AD, it's a hash of the hash. And it lets us actually protect you. One of the biggest things we have is we have our old digital crimes unit. And the digital crimes unit is trawling the dark web. They're looking for leaked credentials. And in, your users today may have gone out and created accounts in who knows what, some other site out there that they got hacked. And they use the same password. If you give us the hash of the hash of the hash and let us get that in Azure AD, when we trawl that dark web, we can find matching credentials. We can find, hey, this dark web credential for that user, the password matches. They've actually been exposed and we can take actions like making them change the password, uh, make them do an MFA, and it will actually alert you. You'll get a report of that vulnerability at a stop a breach replay attack. So there really isn't a downside in sending this hash. It's a hash of the hash. It's non-reversible. You can't get this out. Everyone should have this turned on. It helps you. And even if you are using like a federation or partial authentication to log on to Azure AD, if you had some kind of problem on-prem, if maybe there is some WannaCry attack and you lose your on-prem, I can flip a switch, break glass, and use cloud authentication because the hashes are up there. So I would strongly urge, A, use cloud authentication anyway for the authentication to Azure AD rather than federation. But even if you don't, get the hashes up there. And I get off my soapbox. There you go. It's for your own good. So it's not the hash, it's the hash of the hash. I kind of, kind of stress that point. And so we have the hash of the hash stored in Azure Active Directory, not the hash, not the password. Poor marketing on our time originally, uh, I'll admit that, but it's a hash of the hash. Uh -huh. What's the benefit of putting the password there other than you know, preventing a data breach on, on your on chain? Is there any other? I mean, the, big, I mean, the other biggest um, reason to have the password up there is when we think about how do I authenticate to Azure AD. If we don't have a password, we can't do cloud authentication. You still can come on prem. Right, right, but that means I have to come on prem. Yeah. So that means I have to have federation stood up, or which is a whole bunch of front end servers with load balancing. And then I've got my ADFS farm. Now I'm talking to my domain controllers. This is geoscale. So Azure AD is everywhere. Your, fe your federated environment is probably in a very small location. Um, so you're going to slow down the authentication. It's providing no benefit. There's nothing that federation is really doing that we now wouldn't be doing in the Azure Active Directory. So you're just slowing down the auth and removing some of the scale of it. Whereas if I move to the cloud authentication, it's just kind of that pure flow in Azure AD. So, so a, I mean, performance, there's security we can do that we can't do if you federate. Like there's certain checks we'll do. So when you try and authenticate to Azure AD, we actually go and look at, well, where is that logon attempt coming from? So we'll actually say, hey, look, we know this source, this is a frequent attacker of credentials. We'll just block it without you doing anything or buying any SKU. There's a certain amount of protection just inherent to the platform. We can't do that when you federate because we're just passing on the authentication request. So you actually get a whole bunch of protection built into the platform that we can't do if you federate. And then again, from the scale perspective, from the identity protection perspective of a finding, it's just a lot of benefit for you compared to federation. It's just a whole bunch for you to manage that that's not actually buying you anything. So. So again, I'm totally off my topic. Uh, corporate machines are often hybrid joined. I get a token for AD and Azure AD. And, and basically the point of all of these sort of things is saying is you see all these different credentials, but to boil it down, essentially what is happening is, even though there's two identities here, I get a set of tokens that let me just seamlessly interact between these things. I'm not prompted to authenticate again. I'm not prompted to retype my password. It's just completely seamless to me as a user. We used to love federation. Federation used to be the only way I got single sign-on between AD and the cloud. Now we have seamless sign-on. Seamless sign-on does exactly the same thing. Corporate network, line of sight to a domain controller, we get that same experience. So we used to be, do federation, do federation. Now we're like, ah, oh, don't do that. Um, so change in uh, messaging there. So that's great in our organization. What about outside the organization? So, how many people today have to share data, documents, collaborate with people outside their company? I expect most people do. Um, we, we have to collaborate. 
And so a lot of companies are using Azure AD as their cloud identity provider. And as we talked about, very few companies can work in isolation. We all have to collaborate with someone. They could be a partner, a, a customer for a certain bid we're working on, a vendor. So how do I do that? And remember, historically, there were two patterns. One pattern was I would ask my IT department, hey, create an account for Bob. We, actually, we use the name Sean. We'll say Sean. Sean needs an account. Create an account for Sean. And they go, oh, Sean. Um, but they create an account for Sean. And I have no clue if Sean still works at that company a year later. How do I keep that account healthy? How do I know? So there's a whole bunch of burden on me to maintain and know about that account. And there's other burdens we'll talk about in a second. Or I just email it to Sean. I say, hey, here's this, this secret document we were working on. I've now lost all control of that document. I don't know what he does with it. I don't know who he forwards it on to. I can't bring it back. I have lost all control of that IP. And that, that's not something we can do. And so creating those accounts, which was the common thing we did, is painful for everyone. Um, it's painful for me as the organization, because now I'm having to maintain those accounts for Sean. I'm having to worry about resetting it when Sean invariably forgets the password. If you look at him, he's, he's bound to forget the password. Um, it's painful for Sean's company, because now, if Sean does leave, how does that company disable his account at my company? H how do they know what accounts he has at different companies to cut off his access to stuff? Th there's no link between them. And it, it's painful for Sean because it's another account for him to remember. So no one wants different accounts. So the goal is I want one account. I have my corporate account. Maybe. Maybe it's not a corporate account. I want a single identity that I can use everywhere. That was the promise of kind of federation for people in my company, for the cloud apps I'm using, my employees can use my home identity. But now we're taking that another step. Now it's saying, hey, people in other companies, stuff I have, I don't want to set up SAML relationships with them because it's not consuming an app. I want to be able to give them access maybe to my Azure resources, to my SharePoint sites, to, to enterprise apps that I have federated with. I want them to get all the same access to stuff, potentially, that people in my company can. I still want to be able to do authorization control, what they can access, but I want them to almost act like they're in my uh, Active Directory. So this is Azure AD B2B. This is all about enabling other users to bring their credential for the authentication. That's the important part. And I kind of stress this again. The authentication is taking place at their provider at their Azure AD, at their Microsoft account, at their Gmail account. I'm then doing the authorization. So then that guest credential now shows up as a modified user object in my Azure Active Directory. I'm going to show these super quick, just so you can kind of see this. So if I jump over to my Azure AD, if I go to my users, and if I actually can change this to guest users only, can see I've got a Yahoo account, I've got a Gmail account. You can see the source, there's these different types of sources. I can look at just external users, and you can see there's a few more of those. There's a Microsoft account, there's a, another Azure Active Directory. But they are just users, there's some different flags on them, but they are just users in my Azure Active Directory tenant. I can put them in groups. I can give them access to SharePoint sites. They could view Teams. If I've got federated SaaS apps, I could give them access to them as well. They're in my tenant now. I can give them access to things. Now, that key point is the authentication takes place at their IDP. This is important for everyone. So they have that one credential. They authenticate at their home IDP. If they leave that company, that company disables the account. It's done. They've lost all access to everything in your company because now they can't authenticate. There is no authentication at my IDP. Even if that guest is still present in my directory, they can't log on anymore. So it's, it's gone. They've lost access to everything. So I'm now not worried about that life cycle in terms of them accessing things maybe they shouldn't do anymore. The, the third party has to revoke that account? Right, so what happens is, so there's different layers of this. So their home provider, that's where the identity sits. 
So if they leave the job and that account gets disabled, it will still show as a guest in my Azure Active Directory, but they can't log on to it anymore. So it would still show in my Azure AD, but it's, it's unusable at this point because they can't authenticate their home identity provider. Now, in terms of clearing up our Azure Active Directory, because I don't want a bunch of orphaned accounts, um, there's a number of different flows, and I'll talk about those in a second, but I have things like access reviews, I have time-bombed entitlements that will then go and clear those away over time. Let me take another direction. Uh, say, for instance, a small company, uh -huh. they have a poor HR process, they don't revoke that account over there correctly, it's still active even though the employee's no longer there. How would company, I guess the company that's allowing the access over here, sharing SharePoint, how would they know? I mean, I would not know. I mean, the emphasis is on, sorry. sorry, repeat the question. So the question was, well, what if the sort of the identity provider of the user, their home realm, has got really poor processes and they don't disable their account? What, what happens on my side? At that point, nothing happens on my side. I don't know it's been disabled. They would still be able to go and authenticate. So they'd be able to authenticate to their home identity provider and access all their resources at their old job and access to mine. Right, now there is something we can do on the Azure AD side. So if I'm the one with the SharePoint site, I'm the inviting organization, um, I can have things where I can have access reviews. So I can go and check, should they still have access? I can do things that when I invite them, I time bomb that invite. So it's not forever. It's like, hey, yeah, you, I, I'm gonna invite you for two months. And then I can extend that. So even if that source company is completely useless and don't disable accounts, uh, I can still sort of start to protect my IP. Don, is there, is there a con well, I know there's a concept. Is there a process or a recommendation for assessing relative risk of a partner? So if you know you have a, a way to say, oh, this partner has four processes and therefore it's not as safe as another one. I, I don't know if such a thing exists, but that's sort of a thing. Yeah, so there, there's not a process. So the question was, is there a way to kind of... Um, assess risk of partners and maybe do some action. There's nothing built into Azure AD that is going to say, hey, this particular tenant over here is not going to automatically score them. Now, what I can do as a company, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but if I know kind of that there is a company out there that we do business with, but they're a bit crap, um, and I, I don't want to just let them be added to my organization, one of the things I can do, and you'll forgive me if I click the wrong button the first time, give me a... Things move around, there we go. So I have these kind of external collaboration settings. So one of the things I could do is I could say, look, deny invitations to specified domains. So I can blacklist. So if I know there are certain companies that, you know what, they have a, a terrible record with these things, I don't want them to be able to be guests in my environment, then yes, I can blacklist. Or I could whitelist only particular ones. So I do have that level of control. And when we get into kind of entitlements, I can do exactly the same thing with entitlements. I can whitelist, I can blacklist, I can have an approval workflow, which is even better than actually someone actually go and say, yes, I'm gonna let that account come through. You mentioned workflow. Is there any way to see this from a systematic or diagram kind of perspective? All the different relationships, privileges, and so forth. Are you talking about for someone that is a guest, see what they can do? Access reviews. So the best thing for that is something called access reviews. So access reviews <laughs> is a P2 feature. Uh, and that's where that licensing bit is going to come in. But access reviews let me do a number of different things. I can say, hey, um, I want to do an access review on group membership. I want to do an access review on role assignment. I want to do an access review on application assignment. And I can say, I want to do it as an administrator. I want to delegate it to someone else. And I can even actually do an, a, a self-review. And the reason the self-review is actually good is actually for guests. So what you can actually do is this access review maybe runs every three months on a repeated pattern. And they would have to go and re-certify, yes, I still need this access. That would actually be a way to clear up. If their account had been disabled and they couldn't log on anymore, they wouldn't be able to fill out the access through. They'd get removed from your Azure Active Directory. So access reviews are a big one to go and see who has access to what. 
Um, I mean, there are some reports as well, but that, that's a big one when I think about guests and what they can do. Does that answer the question? Send me. Grab me after. Can we extend our organizational policies to guest users? So, for instance, if we're using conditional access to NFA. Yes, to absolutely. What if there are conflicting policies between our organization and So, let's think about So, it's a fantastic question. So, the question was conditional access. Does conditional access apply to the guests as well? And the answer is 100% yes. And the, the question was, well, how does that handle conflicts? And there really isn't much of a conflict if you think about what conditional access is. So if I kind of go to, these things keep moving around. Um, oh, no, that's not, uh, security. It used to be on the main menu, then they moved it, and now I can't find anything. So conditional access is about, can I, am I allowed to use this resource? So is, is conditional access authentication or authorization? It's authorization. Right, it's authorization. Conditional access doesn't really come into play at authentication. So if you think about, I, I have that scenario you're describing, so if I have kind of the, the of course, yep. why, why would it work? I'll put that back to for the next person, that'd be good. So if I have kind of the user's, uh, Joe, I'm just gonna say Azure AD, it doesn't have to be Azure AD, but just, just as the example. So I've got the user, and now, I've got my Azure AD, where I've got my SharePoint online that I want to get access to. So the authentic, when I try to access SharePoint, SharePoint is going to say, hey, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know who you are, I, I need a, a token from you. What essentially is going to happen is he's going to bounce back over here to get an authentication. So he's going to authenticate at his home. Now, he's got that authentication. He can talk to my Azure Active Directory, which is going to provide the authorization to get access to the SharePoint. So conditional access is going to be in my Azure AD. There isn't really any conditional access for authentication. So it's not so much a conflict. It, it will mainly be, it will be mine. So is it possible in, in conditional access to express like a level of authentication, like 2FA is required to get access to this? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where it gets even more complicated. Um, very upset you brought that up. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> so that's actually a phenomenal point. So MFA, so as part of the access control, so based on all the conditions, I can have certain controls that I want. And you'll notice one of the big ones is I want MFA. So in this case, MFA is part of the authorization of this. So I do not care if they MFA'd over here. As part of this authentication, if they MFA'd, I don't care. I don't trust it. From a B2B perspective, at this point, I do not trust this company that their MFA meets my requirements. So if my conditional access says, hey, they require MFA, they have to MFA against my Azure Active Directory. So even if they MFA'd here, I do not honor any kind of claim in the token coming from then. I will make them MFA on my side, which means they have to have set up MFA on my Azure AD. They have to be licensed for MFA. Does that make sense? And it's not going to cost you any money. Well, no, no, no. Um, does that answer the question? So conditional access, it's not really a conflict because it's authorization layer, which is me. I don't care what they did. So, okay, so question about that. If you're doing that, because we use MFA, and one of the challenges we have, because we have multiple tenants, like a ton of people, if, if they sit there and they've got, a, if they've got their cell phone, that device can only be managed by one Intune. Yep, so that there, were, there were pain points with so this today. The yep. point is they're going to get a phone call, well, so, right, so it depends how we deploy, like, the Authenticator app, how I'm doing the MFA. Okay. So, I mean, you can have multiple organizations registered to the Authenticator app. Yeah, because we like, we like push, yep. if at all possible, but yep. some people, they just simply, you're, you know, they're going to do phone. Yep. They're, so, yes, they would have to register their phone to multiple Azure Active Directories. Now, okay. there is a change under NDA being worked on to allow potentially us to honor the MFA. So if you trust an organization 
and you do want to honor the MFA from them, there is, there's not a timeline for this, right. but there is work being done that we will start to trust this MFA flag. That would be saying you would configure to allow that particular source identity provider. Yeah. I don't know what, I got 105 minutes left. I can't do that kind of math. I have 510 minutes left. I have 15 minutes left. They're telling me to hurry up. Um, but there is work being done about potentially testing that. that I need I'm going to hurry up because I'm being told I've only got 15 minutes left. Um, guest counts have special options in conditional access. So there's actually flags in conditional access to say, is it a guest? Is it an external user? Um, I'm going to go quick, really quick. So essentially, Long and short what this is, um, you license people in your Azure AD, P1 or P2, P2 is like the Rolls Royce, I get access reviews and PIM and all of the good identity protection. For every one person licensed in your company, five guests get the same rights to the features. Yeah. So if I have 1,000 people in my company, I can have 5,000 guests that can all have B2B and identity protection and PIM. So as long as you don't have more than five times the number of guests than you have employees, they can get conditional. They get all the same rights. You don't have to spend any money on them. Does that make sense? So that, that was really all I cared about from the licensing perspective. All right, so who? Who can be guests? There's an ultimate goal um, to really enable any type of account to be used as a guest. Obviously, another Azure AD tenant, they can be a guest. I can invite someone from another Azure AD to be a guest in my Azure AD. That, that would kind of be an obvious one. I can invite a Microsoft account. So it's not a corporate account, it's their live ID sort of thing. I can invite that in as a guest. I can invite a Gmail account. Now, this is not Google at work, so there's a difference. The Gmail is more the personal account. Think of maybe a small mom and pop shop that I, I'm doing some work with, I want to give them access. They can use their Gmail account. I can federate. So if it was Google at work, I would use this SAML WS Fed relationship and federate them in. If none of those apply, we get to a one-time passcode. We will email them a passcode when they try and log on. That passcode is what they have to type in as the password to get to my resources. The point of that is it proves they still have that account. So that company is not Azure AD, um, they, they can't federate, but I want to make sure they still work at the company. So their company address would get emailed a passcode every time they try and access a resource in my company. That's how they authenticate. So if they left that job, they wouldn't have access to the email address anymore. They wouldn't get the code. They couldn't log on. Now, there is a direction to support other types of identity. Um, there are certain types of people that don't even have an email account. Maybe they just have Twitter or Facebook. So there is a kind of push to enable other types of identity. Now, I did want to really quickly show you the experience, but I know I'm very short on time. So um, I won't show the Google one. But I'll show you kind of the Yahoo one. And I have to be careful of the advert it's showing me. Because a second ago, it was showing me singles in my area. I was like, I don't, I don't know where that came from. Honestly, I don't know where that came from. Honestly. All right, so I'm going to try and access uh, my apps. Now, what I have to do is, because it's a guest, I'm going to put in who my tenant is. Like, work with a tenant, I'm trying to access stuff for. So I'm going to use my Yahoo account. And so let's just cut and paste this super quickly. Oh, I can't come paste. That's really inconvenient. Hold on. Give me a second. I'll get there. All right. So I'm going to use a Yahoo account. No one uses Yahoo. Anyone got a Yahoo account anymore? <laughs> no one's going to put their hands up. It's like, no, no not me. Uh, all right. All right. So, so notice what it says is, we just sent you a code to johnsavatyahoo.com. So if I go to my Yahoo mailbox, okay, so here's my verification code. So I can still log on to my Yahoo mailbox or whatever mailbox that will be my work email to prove I still have access to the mailbox. And then paste in the code. Now I'm authenticated. 
So that's the worst case scenario. That's, hey, I can't federate, I can't Gmail, I can't Azure AD. We do a one-time passcode. So that is kind of the worst case. So a Gmail account, I could just authenticate with my Gmail account. If you do Google, there is kind of an extra step required. So if I actually look, I, I've got Google account, and normally I would show this, but Sean keeps putting obnoxious signs saying I've got no time left. Um, so you saw I had a Google account in here. When I have the Google account, there's one setup you have to do, and it's an organizational relationship. So you actually go and add Google as an identity provider. Uh, you go and create an account on Google, you create a token, you paste it into here. It basically lets them have kind of a behind the scenes uh, federation. So now I can add Gmail accounts into my Azure Active Directory. Provisioning process, again, I showed you that allow deny list already for the organizations. Individual users could be sent an invite. So I can kind of send an invite, they'll get the invite, they click a link in the invite, they redeem the invite, and they have to consent. Now it used to be possible through PowerShell to invite people and it was just completely transparent to them. Well, that's not popular with things like GDPR and suddenly giving people rights to things they have not consented to. So now, even if, uh, they don't have to redeem the email, but they will always have to consent. Now, there are things being worked on, maybe about organizational level. There, there's things being done, but right now, from a legal perspective, we need the consent to happen. Um, so essentially, you see, hey, I got that invite. This is the email I would have got sent. I was like, oh, come over to Savile Tech, invited by me. I would choose the account, so I'm going to use, this is where I was, I was doing a Gmail guest. This is the consent. So I have to say, yes, I'm okay with this. So I'm saying, hey, they're going to be able to sign who I am, read my name, email address, and photo. So they have to consent to this. And then once they do that, they're done. Kind of that's the process. So it's a very kind of smooth um, process for them. Now think bigger scale. Now think, okay, I'm working with this company that has a thousand people. I'm not sending an email to a thousand people. Uh, maybe they need different sets of permissions, different rights. So this is where entitlement management comes in. And again, because of time, I'm gonna kind of skip most of this and just talk about what it is. So entitlement management is the idea, if I go to my identity governance, I can create an access package. I'm not very mature. All my demos are Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent and Justice League member. Um, but essentially what I can do here is I can grant a series of things, resources to a user. You can see here I've added them a certain SaaS application. I'm adding them to a certain group. I'm adding them to a certain SharePoint online site. So I create a package of stuff that this entitlement package consists of. And then I can create policies, and the policy can let me stipulate, well, who can get this? Who can actually request it? And let's just edit that quick. So I could say people in my directories, this isn't just for guests. This could be, hey, in my company, I want people from this role to be able to request, hey, I'm elevating up for a period of time. I'm, I'm on this project. I need these sets of access to work on this project. And then it would expire after 60 days, 90 days, whatever you specify. But for guests, it's this. Users not in your directory. And what this will let me actually do is I could specify particular organizations. I could add guests, directories I want to allow to do this. I could say, does it require approval or not? So what I could do is actually whitelist Hey, I'm working um, with this company, SavileTech.com. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but SavileTech.com. Anyone from that company, I'm going to let just accept this entitlement package and automatically be added as a guest and automatically get this. I don't have to do anything. Or I could say, hey, I want it to be approved. There could be a one or two phase approval process. These entitlement packages, I can time bomb them. I can say this lasts for 90 days. After the 90 days, they lose all the rights, they get kicked out as a guest. This is a P2 feature. 
So again, this is where the whole the ritual identity governance, I would need users on my side license for P2 that would let five guests be able to get that capability. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, so I'm at time and I've got three minutes left, so I will stop talking. Uh, and uh, Questions, I know I covered a lot of stuff and I did some of it quickly, I was trying to get as much as possible. Two very quick questions. That, that sounds like a great deal for acquisition. Yep. You know, you, you, can, you can set this up, create. And something I didn't talk about, and this is a prime thing that when I invite a guest, I can change the type. If you actually looked, I don't know if you noticed, when I was showing you my guests, I did guests and there were two, then there were external and there were four. Right. If I have like an acquisition, but I want them to be in my tenant, it may not make sense to treat them as guests because from a rules perspective, they should have the same rights as someone in my local org. So I can change. Notice these two, external Azure AD account and Microsoft account, they are members. So I can convert a guest to a member and that has impacts on maybe my conditional access policies, other types of things I'm doing. So just because they are an invited in via B2B, B2B I mean they have to stay a guest. I can convert them to members. And yes, entitlement management, one of the big places this can be used is, hey, I buy this company, I want them to be able to really work with me in my Azure AD. I would whitelist that tenant and they send them the link, there's an invite link, they just click the link and bolt, they can just enroll themselves in my Azure AD. Yeah. That, that's absolutely a great scenario. Hours of doing, when that stuff gets announced, it's always, oh, congratulations, finance and legal needs to do this. That, that, that's one of the scenarios around this. Can you, on the one-time passcode, can you configure the time interval for that? So like if you have offshore people, can you say, hey, this one-time passcode is going to be good for 12 hours because Ray Ray doesn't get up till 3 a.m. in the morning? Well, the, the, the passcode gets sent to them when they try and authenticate. Okay. okay. It, it, every time they authenticate, they get the passcode sent to them. So I think the passcode lasts maybe 15 minutes or something. It, it, it's, it's as they authenticate. Okay, cool. Any other questions? If I no longer trust a partner and I want them to go away and I just remove them from the allowed partners to all of their entitlements disappear? No. No, you, you clean it up. And, and there's scripts out there to do that easily. But yes, you, you would have to clear that up. Yeah. I can revoke, but I'd have to do that action. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? You got one minute, John. Got one minute. I dance. Entitlement review. How I also scavenge stale accounts. Right. So the access review. So the access review. There's actually a special option for access review for guests. So I can actually run it for guests. And one of the nice things for the stale ones, if you make them do a self review, you can simply maybe you can set it as a recurrence. So I could have every 60 days make guests do a self access review and tell me why they still need access. So if they say they don't need access or they don't respond you purge them. So that's actually a nice way to get rid of the stale account, set up a recurring access with you, and they'll clean themselves out. Yep. Okay, well, I think I'm at exactly time. So uh, appreciate you uh, coming to the session.